The Texas Parks and Wildlife television series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Turkeys were historically found throughout close to 30 million acres in East Texas. So this is part of their historic range. When you see that number of sharks and biomass removed from the ocean, it's very problematic. Learning doesn't happen in the classroom. Learning happens everywhere. Every experience they're having is a learning experience. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. These Iowa residents are getting a new home in East Texas. We received 31 birds today from Iowa, and those birds will be going out to the Angelina National Forest. Any of these birds that come into Texas from out of state, we draw blood for disease testing. We need to stop. We've been really lucky, have really healthy birds coming in. In addition to that, the University of Georgia is doing DNA on all these birds. Keeping track of their kind of pedigree, just like dogs. Each bird is banded with their own ID. 45466. Four, six. And will become part of a restocking effort that has been taking place for more than 40 years. Turkeys were historically found throughout close to 30 million acres in East Texas. So this is part of their historic range. Around the turn of the 20th century, we lost birds due to overharvest primarily. European settlers coming into Texas, there were no regulations to stop them from harvesting those animals and no law enforcement out there to enforce the few regulations that we did have. The eastern wild turkey was nearly wiped out due to habitat loss and unregulated hunting. With new laws in place, a plan was put in motion to bring the eastern turkey back to Texas. The early efforts began with wild trapped eastern turkeys in 1979. Dr. Roel Lopez coined the phrase superstocking. See you in Texas. He said if we put large numbers of birds on the ground, up to about 70 to 80 birds, that even under the worst case scenario, you'd have a really good opportunity for success, as long as you're focusing on quality habitat. Everybody ready? First group, let's go ahead, open that second flat, and dump them, let them go. Now, in addition to restocking turkeys, biologists are trying to find out what habitat helps turkeys thrive. Texas Parks and Wildlife was looking for a group to study the effect of prescribed fire on the reproduction of eastern wild turkeys. And so we're out here studying the movement and the reproduction period of, of these birds. The students will be able to track the birds outfitted with GPS transmitters and look at where they nest versus where they forage for food. You know, are they using a first year burn? Are they using a second year burn? Or how are they using it? Using with Google Earth, we can animate that and, and kind of show you what the toms are doing and what the hens are doing. This latest release meets the super stocking quota for the study. I'm excited that we had now have all 80 of the birds for the study on the ground. And so essentially we're just going to be looking at the movement behavior. We'll, we'll start doing vegetation sampling at each nest site and then that'll go into this first year's worth of data and then we'll come back and do it again next year. Since 1979, more than 7,500 eastern turkeys have been released into 56 counties in East Texas on wildlife management areas, private lands and national forests. Well, from what we can tell, the birds appear to be doing pretty well. We have some of our highest populations of turkeys in East Texas on that side. So we know that it can be very successful.
This project was funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife Restoration Program. Good. Squeeze again. So I taught PE and, and biology and health. Now you know how hard it is for the spider to make her web, don't you? And I decided I didn't want to be inside any longer. I like being outside. And I think this is the perfect fit for me. I'm hoping that the kids have as much fun as I have. The spider in the web. It's not what we know, it's how we think about nature. The spider in the web. Project Wild provides the curriculum for that. Growing Up Wild provides the curriculum for that. I use it almost every day. Project Wild is professional development for educators to help them teach about wildlife and wildlife issues. On any given Saturday, somebody in Texas is probably getting trained in Project Wild. I'm trying to wake you up. Heads up. Where's your thumb? Yay! And there are hundreds of facilitators who are certified to conduct those trainings pretty much anywhere. Is there more water than land? Yes. In the workshop, they get a book and the teachers learn how to teach the children. We chose activities that deal with the same concept but at different grade levels. And these activities not only were written by educators, but piloted by educators before they are given out in workshops. It's just not all science. You can also teach literacy, you can teach uh, mathematics, you can teach social studies. What you're gonna do is teach this to the rest of us and have us participate like we're the students. I've done every single one of these with the kids in this book. The Project Wild activities are experience-based regardless of the level of your students. Everyone in the class will have shared the same experience with the content, and then the teacher has something to work from. When you attend a Texas Parks and Wildlife, Project Wild workshop. You receive it from a facilitator who is local to your area and resources that are pertinent for that area. The really tiny things that you end up finding the most interest and the most detail. You get real lucky you might hit a snake. They know what the issues in their area are and they're going to make the workshop most relevant for their audience at their site. Our old friend, uh, Mountain Seer, it's the male that puffs out that yellow pollen um, that's giving you those aller allergy problems. This program helps people overcome oh, some maybe preconceived notions uh, of icky tree, bugs reaction. and things like that. Check it out, watch. Oh, ew. Oh. Oh. <laughs> that red is used as a dye, still to this day. There's a lot of visual activity, so this appeals to so many different children and the way that they learn. Having lessons that are using the outdoors to teach, um, it can't be beat. The goal or the struggle or the challenge as a prey is to get over to the end, grab some food and get back to shelter and not get eaten by the predator. We're playing about a five minute round. You should only take one token of food at a time. The thing that makes Project Wild Workshops different is that you actually do the activities as if you were a kid. They demonstrate with the participants how to do the activities. 30 seconds. And discuss from a teacher's perspective how you would use them and what the advantages and disadvantages of some of the strategies are and that sort of thing. <laughs> so this Project Wild Training today was designed to educate educators. This all-day shop gave them some ideas and some tools to pass these nature-based messages on to their students. Class, class, class. Thank you for getting quiet. We are going to be talking about and doing a game about predators 
and prey. It's pretty in the thicket is a great lesson to teach predator-prey relationship. Raise your hand and remind me, what is a predator? As well as how animals adapt to their surroundings to deal with predator-prey situations. And that's fun because it's very active. And they get to be the predator and prey and they get to experience it. Come here, predator. I'm gonna take her all the way over here. She is going to turn around and she's gonna look for all her prey. If she sees you and she calls your name, you have to come with her, you're gonna be a predator too. They will hide in our garden space, but still have to have their eye on the predator. And go, one, two, three. And we'll discuss why you want your eye on the predator. Just so they can say how close can you get to the predator without being noticed because you've adapted to the environment. 18, 19, 20. Now, who can you see? Call out their names. Mommy, I saw you, Dama. Usually, I have one idea I want them to take away from it. You know, big idea. But the other thing I want them to understand for it is learning doesn't happen in the classroom. Learning happens everywhere. Every space they're in, every experience they're having is a learning experience. Max, I saw you. <laughs> Come on up, Max. And then we'll deconstruct it and figure out what worked and get their opinions. What was the easiest thing for you to spot somebody? I mean, what we want to do is help children grow up into adults who can think about the wildlife and their habitats. It would be nice if some of them grew up to be wildlife biologists, but really we would just like everyday people to just kind of get it. Shark! Big shark! Big shark! These biologists have nicknamed this massive tiger shark Sam Houston, and he's being caught for science. Washer. They are attaching a tracking transmitter, all in an effort to help save the species. Sharks play very, very important roles in our marine ecosystem. Uh, without having these top end, what we call apex predators, you have the ecosystem that gets out of balance. Um, these predators help control everything below them. And now these wolves of the ocean are in trouble. Worldwide, sharks have been depleted by overfishing. Between 30 and 70 million sharks killed by humans every year. What impact that has, we simply don't know because we don't have a firm understanding of really even how many sharks are out there. Catching sharks for their fins is a billion dollar a year business. One of the things that has contributed to a decline in sharks was uh, shark finning. Fishermen who actually catch the sharks and, and cut their fins off and discard the body. Since 1993, that practice has been illegal in American waters, but it still continues in, in foreign waters because they can get you know up to $900 a pound for the shark fins. As Asia, and in particular China's economy, thrives, the demand for extravagant shark fin soup has exploded, and there are few international fishing regulations in place. We have a worldwide concern about the status of shark populations. When you see that number of sharks and biomass removed from the ocean, it's very problematic. And that's where the science really comes in, is what does the true abundance of these sharks look like? Texas Parks and Wildlife biologists keep a close eye on sharks every summer by doing what's called a long line study. This morning we're going to the Gulf of Mexico and our, uh, our target is to catch as many sharks as we can and just tag as many sharks as we can. The bait that we use is Atlantic mackerel. It's a really oily fish, and uh, the sharks seem to like it. If you have, 
we're setting the line right now. The line comes out off of the spool, and as we're going, we have these hooks and these barrels. We we'll pull those out of the barrel and just clip them onto the line as we go. We use these long lines to help us monitor the distribution and abundance of sharks within the Gulf of Mexico. Yep, shark! Black tip, male! There's definitely an adrenaline rush. Uh, that's that's one where, reason I'm on the back of the boat. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's uh, pretty exciting when you get to jump on top of a shark and you feel that pulse about when they're about to just freak out. Watch, 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 watch. Bill. There you go. Good tag. I need a link. 1444. I need a weight. 164. Whoa. Whoa. All right, just let it go, let it go, let it go. The sharks that we catch, we also tag and release. We go ahead and lay it over the side like that. So we get information on their movements and their growth rates. And we can use all that information to help manage and conserve shark species. A major scientific concern we have with shark populations in Texas are understanding their migration patterns. Uh, understanding where they go and when can be essential towards their proper management. So now, Sam Houston and many more sharks have been tagged by scientists from the Heart Research Institute. We have literally 50 or more sharks tagged. Um, they're swimming around, reporting back, and telling us all type of scientific information. And it turns out that information is a bit troubling. In general, we see a southward movement into Mexico. And that movement pattern concerns us somewhat, given that there's large gill net fleets as well as longline fleets that are in operation in those waters. And that is the most immediate threat here on the Texas coast. Unbelievable amount of sharks, anywhere between two and 3,000. We've got Mexican commercial fishermen that come into U.S. waters. The most common type of species that is being caught on this illegal gear are sharks. So throughout the year, game wardens head for the coastal border. You know when you can read that name, Mary. I'm going to try to read it as well. Checking on compliant fishermen is easy. Captain, you all seen any other traffic besides yourselves out here in this area? No, sir. But spotting an illegal net or long line in this immense ocean, now that's a struggle. It, it definitely uh, it weighs on me because it, it is a large amount of water that I'm trying to cover with this one vessel. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And you have to keep your eyes peeled day and night. Here's the main line right here. We're about uh, half a mile north of the Mexican border and about two and a half miles offshore. Big black drum. These lines like this, they're undiscriminating. They'll catch anything. It'll take that bait is going to get caught on those circle hooks. These lines could be as long as four and five miles long. It's a shark. It's a little shark. Go ahead and pull it up. <laughs> and he should be just fine. He was still very much alive. And that's it. We've probably picked up a mile and a half, maybe two miles of line. This is what we're out here to do, is, is to protect this resource. Tell. Got to tell, got to tell. Right. Through protection, awareness, 16-4, and conservation, there is hope for these wolves of the ocean. Besides having inherent value as living creatures, they're vitally important in helping maintain the balance in the ecosystems in which they live. Hammer, 1870. Good tag. So it's incredibly important that we do all we can to protect them.
The future of our shark populations literally hangs in the balance of what we do today. It's very important that we properly manage these species and understand them scientifically so they're sustainable for future generations. Now, as far as Sam Houston goes, that tiger shark is alive and well as he continues to provide crucial data. As for all the other sharks in these waters, it's up to us to make sure they are still here tomorrow. In a small place like this, there should be a lot of catfish in here. About an hour northwest of Dallas, in Fannin County, there is a very small lake. There was something jumped over there. Yep. Big splash. And surrounding that lake is a very small state park. At this park, you get to know your people a little bit more. It's more of an intimate setting. Small is good. Covering just 261 acres, Bonham State Park is one of the smallest in the state park system. One thing people like about this park is the size of the lake being 65 acres. They can get out in their canoes, kayaks, and kind of relaxing atmosphere that you can't get at larger parks. Located about 20 miles from the Texas-Oklahoma line, Bonham is a mix of blackland prairie grasses and woodlands of oak, ash, and eastern red cedar. Migrant songbirds share the park with raccoons, possums, and beaver. 11 miles of hike and bike trails circle the park. Uh, we ride the trails as often as we can, uh, usually four or five times a week, in the afternoon after work. Great trails, a lot of trees, a lot of tight turns. Not too technical, but you've got to be in pretty good shape to ride them. Cotton fields once covered the original park site. But in the 1930s, the Civilian Conservation Corps transformed the landscape into what you see today. They built this lake, the pavilion down by the swim area, the old boathouse, along with the office. It's amazing. I love coming to work every day, going to that old building, and knowing what those gentlemen did back during the Depression. Ready to go? Bonham hosts events throughout the year, like this kid's fishing rodeo designed to introduce youngsters and their parents to the Texas outdoors. Actually, we didn't even know it was going to be here, so we just happened to show up and, and it was here. And I caught one. So we jumped right in. Visitors can also explore the nearby town of Bonham, which got its start in the 1830s. Named in honor of James Butler Bonham, who died defending the Alamo, it's the hometown of Sam Rayburn, the longest serving speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. When Sam Rayburn passed away, they had his funeral here. And at his funeral, we had Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, John Kennedy, who was the sitting president, and had LBJ. So here at Baum, Texas, back in 1961, we had two ex-presidents, a sitting president and a future president. And how many towns in Texas can say that? Despite being small, Bonham State Park has a lot to offer. Whether it's riding the trails, or just hanging around the campsite. At Bonham State Park, size doesn't really matter. So it's a quick getaway where people can get away from the rat race in the big city and come back out here and just recharge their batteries.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.